I'm Larry, and welcome to the latest installment of the Old Gazer channel, where, as uh, you may know, uh, we talk about amateur astronomy, especially uh, with regard to those of you who may be uh, uh, inexperienced beginners in the hobby. Uh, and the, the goal of this channel is just to provide some practical advice and suggestions and information, and hopefully just a little bit of inspiration as well to help you through the rough spots as you try to make your way through the learning curve towards becoming an amateur astronomer. So that's who we are, that's what we're about. And uh, with that, let's get started with today's video. Uh, I feel like I've dropped the ball a little bit. I think this is maybe the 11th or 12th uh, video in this series, something like that. And I think I probably should have done this one uh, much earlier. Uh, but, you know, uh, you know, I'm sure you will understand that I'm entitled to a senior moment here and there and, <laughs> and better late than never, so we're going to do it now. Uh, we're going to do a video today where we're going to talk about the different types of objects in the night sky that are available for amateur astronomers to view, to image, to study, uh, to be amazed at, to be inspired by. Uh, and so, you know, you may know a lot about these things already, and those of you that do can just tune this video out. But those of you who may be uh, really uh, uh, inexperienced beginners, there might be some information in here that'll be of value to you. So uh, so let's uh, let's just carry on and, and do that for your benefit, shall we? This is going to be a very simplified discussion of the night sky objects that are the, uh, the pursuit or the goal of uh, amateur astronomers in terms of finding things to view and, and image and so forth. Uh, and it's going to be simple again because I presume my audience is primarily inexperienced beginners. And also, as I've said many times on these videos already, I'm a simple-minded guy. It's all I can do to stay ahead of uh, too many senior moments and simple's about all I can handle. So simple is what you get when you watch my videos. Okay, uh, let's talk about uh, the categories of objects that are uh, in the night sky for us to study and view and image and, and be inspired by. And let's start out with probably the most fundamental thing in the night sky, uh, and that would be stars. Uh, you know, uh, when you go out on a moonless night, and if you have the good fortune to be in relatively dark skies, you know, the sky is just amazing, beautiful, inspiring, exciting, uh, uh, all at once. You know, just a beautiful thing with all of those stars. Uh, uh, they're hanging across the sky, spangled across the sky, if you will. Just a beautiful thing to see. Uh, I sometimes like to go outside without a telescope with just my uh, uh, eyes or maybe binoculars and just sit for a while and just look at the sky, just sort of at random, just looking around at its beauty, looking for things that are interesting. Uh, I sometimes take my telescope out and do the same thing. I don't have a specific goal in mind when I go out there. I'll just point it at the sky and, and just look at star fields and the background of stars as they pass through the, uh, the field of view of my telescope. Uh, and you can see some very interesting and very beautiful things that way. So. Uh, some of the brightest stars in the sky are excellent things to look at with a telescope. You can see nuances of color and brightness and those kind of things. And if you're into photography and you want to take some uh, long exposure photographs of those stars, you can sometimes get some really nice diffraction patterns and that kind of thing. Uh, and there are some amateur astronomers who have accepted the challenge of trying to resolve as many double stars as they can. You know, that's a real challenge for amateurs. Uh, and it can be really challenging if you don't have a lot of uh, aperture with your telescope, but uh, that's something that can be very interesting to do and very challenging to do. So, you know, just looking at the stars and the night sky is something that we probably don't think about too much once we get into the hobby, but it's really refreshing, really interesting, and really inspiring just to sometimes go out and just look at the stars in the sky. Okay, second thing I want to talk about is constellations. Now, 
All of you know what a constellation is, I'm sure. It's stars in the sky that seem to form a pattern that reminds you of a mythological person or event or circumstance, or maybe a geometric shape or something like that. Constellations have been around for probably pretty much the entire history of mankind. When people first started looking up at the stars and seeing things up there that reminded them of, of uh, things, and they just, uh, you know, called them whatever. Uh, and of course, that, uh, that went through many iterations and, uh, and many versions over many centuries and many years. You come down to today, and today we have 88 constellations uh, in the night sky that are uh, internationally accepted as the standard constellations. Uh, they are the 88 constellations that are, everybody agrees on, and, uh, and, and so uh, that's what we have today. Now, uh, some of these are very familiar. You know, the Orion constellation is a very familiar one. Uh, Taurus is kind of easy to spot because you can see the horns of the bull up there. Uh, others are very easy to spot, but uh, why are constellations important? Well, uh, they're beautiful in and of themselves. You know, I don't know about you, but I sometimes have a lot of trouble looking up there and seeing what the people who first named these constellations saw. <laughs> I'll take their word for it. I have to have those pictures drawn for me on my uh, planetarium app on my smartphone to show me what, the, what I'm really looking at. <laughs> but uh, at, at any rate, uh, they're beautiful to look at. They're traditional. But one of their main values is that they are indispensable in helping us find objects in the night sky because every object in the night sky is said to be located in such and such a constellation. For example, there is a beautiful globular star cluster called M13 in the Messier catalog, and that star cluster happens to be uh, in the constellation Hercules. So that's how we go about uh, beginning to find M13 when we want to view it or image it or whatever. We first find the constellation Hercules, and then we find out where exactly within that constellation to concentrate on, and we'll find M13 and be able to view it. So that's just a, an illustration, one illustration. All objects are said to reside in one of the 88 constellations, okay? Now, I'm going to give you a resource here, and I'll include this in the description of the video, uh, a place where you can learn all you want to know about constellations. You can see a full list of the 88 constellations, get a good sense of at least which major uh, uh, objects, uh, deep sky objects, or, uh, are uh, uh, located in those constellations, and other information about constellations in general. That resource is iau.org iau.org. That stands for International Astronomical Union. And you can read about them when you get to that website and see what they're all about. It has, uh, you know, uh, serious astronomers from all over the world that are part of that organization and others as well. Uh, but that's where you can find out all that you might want to know and then some about constellations. And I urge you to check that resource out and take a look at that. Of course, if you have a planetarium app on your smartphone, you can study the constellations there uh, as well uh, and learn a lot about them there. Now, as a self-respecting amateur astronomer, you may just be beginning, but if you're going to be able to call yourself a, a legitimate self-respecting amateur astronomer, you need to know a lot about the constellations. Now, that's something that will come over time, probably. I'm not saying run out tonight and memorize them all and, and learn everything about them tonight, but uh, the constellations are, are just how this night sky is broken up pretty much and in order to find things in the night sky unless you're using one of these computerized go-to telescopes uh, you need to know where objects are in the night sky and your first uh, indication of where they are is to find out which constellation they reside in so constellations very important now let's talk about uh, uh, something called asterisms. What is an asterism? Well, like constellations, asterisms are groups of stars in the night sky. They're not constellations. In many cases, they are uh, uh, subgroups of constellations, you know, a group of stars that's within a larger constellation. 
uh, or they may, you know, uh, use elements from various constellations in their makeup. They're groups of stars that seem to have some sort of connection when you look at them. Maybe they look like a, a geometric object. Maybe they look like some other object uh, in the sky. Uh, maybe they look like, uh, uh, you know, some figures or whatever from mythology. Not constellations, but other fairly easily recognizable groups of stars that can also be of great value in helping you find things in the night sky. I'll give you a prime example of that. Consider, this for, for those of us in the Northern Hemisphere, let's consider the Big Dipper. The Big Dipper. Now, a lot of people think that the Big Dipper is a constellation, but actually it is not. Uh, the seven stars and the Big Dipper are part of a much bigger constellation known as Ursa Major. Uh, and But uh, those seven stars are an asterism that look like a dipper. And of course, we're all familiar probably with how there are two pointer stars in the Big Dipper that point the way directly to the North Star, which is very, very close to the North Celestial Pole and is of great value to us in the Northern Hemisphere in helping us find our way around the sky and align telescopes and all those kinds of things. So, uh, asterisms, uh, groups of stars uh, in the sky that seem to have uh, some pattern or shape to them uh, uh, beyond constellations uh, and can be of value in helping us find things in the night sky. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay, we've talked about uh, stars, we've talked about constellations, we've talked about asterisms. Uh, let's start to get a little more specific now. Uh, and the first thing that I want to talk about is the moon. Uh, more than likely, the vast majority of, of people uh, look at the moon the first time they look through a telescope. I mean, it's just the way it is. It's uh, in the sky, it's easy to find, it's pretty easy to get within the field of view of your telescope. Uh, it's just, uh, you know, usually the first thing that people see when they look through a telescope. That was certainly the case with me, probably the case with many of you as well. I'm not going to say a whole lot about the moon. We know it's there, we know it's available to us, we know that it's an amazing, beautiful uh, subject to view in the night sky. Uh, I'm actually going to have a separate video coming up somewhere down the road, which is going to be a concern with uh, providing some tips for viewing and imaging the moon. Now, you may think you don't need to do that. It's pretty easy to view or image the moon, but there might be a few uh, uh, little gems of, of wisdom in there somewhere that might be of value to you. So I have that plan. So I'm not going to talk anymore about the moon. The moon is just one of the Wonderful things available for us to view and image and study and be amazed by in the night sky. Okay, let's move on now to the planets. Of course, we know there are eight planets uh, plus one uh, dwarf planet, I guess it's called, or whatever it's called now. I'm referring to Pluto, of course. Uh, so, uh, looking at the planets can be an extremely rewarding and exciting and inspiring experience. So the views of the planets through a telescope can be really beautiful to see. Uh, there are some planets that are much easier to see than others. Some of them are readily apparent just with the unaided eye. Venus uh, is a very bright, I think it might be the second brightest object in the night sky after the moon. Uh, Jupiter is also normally very bright. Saturn is also bright, less so than Jupiter, but still pretty bright. Uh, you can see Mars with the unaided eye. Uh, uh, I, you, I'm told that you can see Mercury with the unaided eye if you know where and when to look, but it's uh, viewing Mercury is very difficult. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. But the, the, my, the primary planets that people are usually interested in viewing uh, are Venus, Jupiter, Saturn, and Mars. So let's talk about those for just a moment. Uh, with any decent backyard telescope, when you view Jupiter, you're going to be able to see the so-called Galilean moons of Jupiter. That's the four moons that are visible to most small telescopes. 
Uh, you'll, you may be able, depending on seeing conditions, to see the cloud bands across Jupiter, and you might even be lucky enough, if the positioning of the planet is right, you might be able to catch a glimpse of the red spot, the great red spot on Jupiter. Uh, so very, very uh, intriguing, interesting, beautiful object to view through your telescope. Saturn, incredibly beautiful through a telescope. When you behold those rings, and if you've got a decent telescope and seeing conditions are pretty good, you'll be able to see the Cassini division between those rings of Saturn. Just a, an amazing object to look at in the night sky. You know, inspiring, exciting, all of that. Uh, Venus uh, it will show up uh, as a disk uh, in most uh, uh, a uh, amateur telescopes, but you won't be able to see any surface detail on the planet Venus because Venus is perpetually uh, uh, covered in clouds. Uh, and so you just can't see, all you can see is a sort of a bright disk. You can, however, see the phases of Venus. Uh, for planets that are uh, between the Earth and the Sun, they have phases uh, uh, similar to the moon, and one interesting thing to do is to try to view the phases uh, of Venus and perhaps image those phases. Uh, you're not going to be able, however, to see any planetary detail because of the cloud cover there. Mars. Mars is a little bit uh, more of a challenge because it's much smaller than Jupiter or Saturn, and it's going to show up in most amateur telescopes as a pretty small disk. That's why you're going to want probably a long focal length and, and a pretty high magnification to try to view not just Mars, but all the planets actually, but especially one like Mars, you're going to need high magnification to pull out some planetary detail. If you're fortunate, if you've got enough magnification and if the seeing conditions are good enough, you might be able to see the polar cap. You might be able to see some other details. Uh, on the surface of Mars. So very, very interesting subject to try to look at uh, in the night sky. Neptune and Uranus, uh, you're never going to be able to see more than just a very small disk in an amateur telescope. Uh, and it might look a little bit greenish or bluish, but that's about all you're going to be able to see. But it's uh, nice to say that you've been able to see those uh, planets through your telescope. So uh, that's very interesting. Mercury, very difficult to find and view because it's always close to the sun. It's a challenge to find and view Mercury, but it can be done. And it surely will be very satisfying if you're able to do that. Uh, let me mention one other thing about some of the planets, uh, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn especially. Uh, the best time to view those planets is when they are in a state of uh, opposition. Now, what do I mean by opposition? That is the point at which they are closest to the Earth, and it happens to be that point when the Earth is directly between them and the Sun. Uh, so planets come into opposition uh, periodically on a regular basis. Uh, Jupiter and Saturn are at opposition about once every year or so, and that usually happens in late summer, uh, maybe early fall, and that would be the best time to try to view those planets because that's when they're closest to the Earth, and you'll get, hopefully, a little bit better and more detailed view. Uh, Mars, it's especially important to, uh, to try to view Mars when it's in opposition, because you need to do everything you can to try to increase its size and to bring out a little more detail on Mars. And, of course, you can do that better if it's closer to the Earth. So, uh, Mars is in opposition, I believe, every couple of years. So anyway, that's the planets. Wonderful, exciting, inspirational uh, things to view uh, through our telescopes in the night sky. Uh, very, very enjoyable, rewarding experience. Again, when you're viewing the planets, you're probably going to want a longer, longer focal length and as much magnification as seeing conditions will allow so that you can see as much detail as possible. Enough about the planets. Uh, we're going to go on now to the various classes of deep sky objects, which are defined as objects that are beyond the solar system. Uh, there are several kinds of deep sky objects. We're going to briefly talk about all of them here in just a minute. But before we do that, let me uh, just sort of 
interject something here that I think is important. When we're looking at lists of objects in the sky to view or image or to study, maybe we're looking at the Messier catalog or the NGC catalog and just learning a little bit about all of these objects, you know, what constellation they're in, uh, how difficult they are to view and image and that kind of thing. Or when we're looking through our telescope, even, uh, these objects look small, uh, especially in a, 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 a wide field of view. And there's a tendency for us to kind of lose track of just how amazing these objects are, just how vast these objects are. It's, it's kind of easy to lose sense of the fact that, let's take the, uh, the Orion Nebula, for example, here. When you're looking at the Orion Nebula through your telescope, you're looking at photons that left the Orion Nebula about 1,400 years ago and have been traveling through space all that time and are just now reaching your eye so that you can view it. An amazing thing when you think about it. So when you view the Orion Nebula, you're not looking at it as it is now. You're looking at it as it was 1,400 years ago because it's so far away. 1,400 light years from Earth. And by the way, a light year is about 6 trillion miles. So you can see how far away it is. It's also extremely vast. It's 24 light years approximately across. Again, a light year being six trillion miles or about 10 million, uh, uh, 10 trillion uh, kilometers, pardon me. Uh, very, very, it's huge, it's vast. We just don't get that sense usually when we're just thinking about it or reading about it or looking at it through the eyepiece of our telescope. But these things exist on a vast scale. Uh, to my puny mind, it's very difficult sometimes for me to get my mind around the kind of scales that we're confronted with when we consider the cosmos. But, you know, it's, it's just uh, something that I think we need to pause and think about sometimes and really just try to re re uh, recall what it is that we're looking at through our telescopes and how incredible these things are. So I just thought I'd throw that in, uh, no extra charge for that before we uh, get uh, further with our discussion. So let's move on. Let's talk first of all here about nebulae. Nebulae can be among the most beautiful objects in the night sky. They can be just absolutely gorgeous. What are nebulae? Well, basically they are clouds of dust and gas out there in the cosmos. Uh, if the nebula is dense enough, such as the Orion Nebula, which we've been discussing already, uh, there's enough gravitational uh, effect going on inside that nebula to bring the matter within that nebula uh, together, and uh, over time, uh, stars will actually form within that nebula. So there are stars being created uh, right now in the Orion Nebula, uh, don't quote me on this, but I believe I read recently that astronomers have now found evidence of 700 stars that are in various stages of development uh, on their way to becoming full-fledged stars being created within that nebula out of the materials that exist within that nebula. So that's an amazing thing to consider right there. Now, uh, some nebulae, nebulae are called emission nebulae, and that's because they emit their own light, usually because there is ionized gas present in that nebula. Uh, uh, there are other types of nebula known as reflection nebula, which don't create their own light, but which shine or glow uh, from, uh, by reflecting light from nearby stars. But then there's also something called dark nebulas, which are ones that have neither their own light nor nearby stars whose light they might reflect, and therefore they basically just show up as big black spots in the sky, and if they're dense enough, they will hide whatever is behind them, and they'll just be a black void in the sky. Uh, so those are three types of nebula, uh, nebulae, pardon me, I, I, I keep forgetting to use the proper plural here, uh, 
Let's talk about two other kinds of nebulae. One of these would be planetary nebula. Now, this is confusing, and it's a little bit counterintuitive here because planetary nebulae have absolutely nothing to do with planets. They're called planetary nebulae because they first started to be viewed way back in the early years, probably in the 1700s or so, possibly before that, uh, people started to first view these through their, uh, their telescopes, but they couldn't tell anything about them, and it was very difficult for them to distinguish uh, these objects from planets. And so they kind of thought they were planets, I suppose, and the name planetary got attached to them, and it's something that's just stuck over all the years right down to the ple present time. So even though these nebulae have nothing to do with planets, they are referred to as planetary nebulae. What is a planetary nebula? A planetary nebula is what's left over from a dying star uh, a, 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 of intermediate mass, a star that, is, uh, that has a mass about equal to our sun or up to eight times more massive than our sun is going to end its life cycle as a planetary nebula. I'm not going to go into how all that works because I'm too stupid to understand it all, quite frankly, <laughs> or too simple-minded. Oh, hey, wait a minute. I'm too old. I'm too, my senior self just can't grasp some things. No, that it has to do with how gravitational forces and the outward forces associated with the fusion going on inside a star become unbalanced and the star starts to contract and expand and goes through all of these things one after the other. And a lot of stuff gets ejected out into space as a result of all of that, thereby creating a planetary nebula. Uh, I believe the Ring Nebula and the Dumbbell Nebula are pretty good examples of planetary nebula. They're usually round or nearly round in shape or oval or something like that, uh, but uh, are very interesting and they can be very beautiful objects uh, when viewed through a telescope, planetary nebula. Uh, the other one that I want to mention is a supernova remnant. I don't know if there's another name for this type of nebula or if that's just what it's called, a supernova, supernova re, a remnant, but it's just as the name implies. A, uh, 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 it is a nebula that's left over from uh, the effects of a star going supernova when stuff is thrown out into space uh, and uh, it's full of ionized gas, so it glows usually very brightly. Uh, and this, this happens when stars are, are massive. Uh, I believe the th sort of the threshold there is uh, stars greater than eight times the mass of our own sun usually will end their lives uh, as a, a, a supernova remnant, that kind of, uh, of uh, nebula in the sky. Uh, a good example of that is uh, the Crab Nebula, M M1. The Crab Nebula is a, a supernova or a remnant. So. Those are just a few comments, probably too many, about nebulae and uh, uh, some of the most beautiful objects in the night sky. That's a little bit of discussion about the different kinds of, of nebulae and what you might expect to see when you look at them. Uh, amazing objects, amazing uh, things, vast, incredibly vast, incredibly far away. Star factories, some of them are, if they're dense enough but always fascinating to look at. Uh, so, let's move on. Next thing I want to talk about is galaxies. Uh, so what is a galaxy? Well, I think you all probably know basically what a galaxy is. I kind of like to think of it as like an island universe out there in the overall universe. It's a massive collection of stars and dust and I suppose dark matter and other stuff that's all together in a mass, uh, uh, held together by gravitational attraction, revolving around a central core. Uh, galaxies can be large or they can be small galaxies that usually are satellite galaxies of the larger ones, but uh, you know, just, uh, uh, containing millions or maybe trillions of stars in each galaxy. 
Our own galaxy, of course, is called the Milky Way. And by the way, uh, just as a, in passing here, the word galaxy comes from a Greek word galaxias, which literally means milky. So that's where galaxy comes from. Now you can amaze your friends with that bit of trivia, if you'd like. Uh, uh, we we're in the Milky Way galaxy. The next closest galaxy to us is, of course, the Andromeda galaxy, which is one of the most spectacular objects that we can view in the night sky. Very large, it has an angular size of about three degrees, which means it's six times greater than the size of the full moon when, we, when we're able to look at it. Uh, has those uh, uh, spiral arms uh, going around the bright core. And uh, again, don't quote me on this, but I think I read very recently somewhere that based on new data that's just become available in 2021, uh, astronomers now believe that there, there might be as many as 200 billion galaxies in the known universe as we know it now. And each one of those galaxies contains billions or possibly trillions of stars. We again have long since reached that point where uh, you know, my, my ability to comprehend these uh, scales that vast is just, uh, you know, non-existent. <laughs> you know, I can't wrap my head around that. It's incomprehensibly vast to me, but that is the kind of universe in which we live. Uh, and many of these galaxies are available for amateur astronomers to view or image, uh, the most notable example of which is the Andromeda galaxy. Uh, so, Enough said about galaxies right now. We could go on and on and on about that. You can research this on the internet all you want to. Find out everything you want to know and then some about galaxies. Let's move on. Next thing I want to talk about is star clusters. To me, personally, star clusters are some of the most beautiful objects in the sky. What is a star cluster? Well, it's just what the name implies. It's a cluster or a group of stars that appear to be very close together when you look at them through your telescope. Now, there's basically two kinds of star clusters. There are open clusters where the stars are, which may only have up to a few hundred stars that are separated by a good distance from one another and have less gravitational attraction than the other type. Uh, and where the stars might eventually become, you know, uh, uh, not part of that uh, cluster anymore. Uh, the most famous example, I suppose, the most readily visible and viewable of the uh, open star clusters is the Pleiades, uh, which you can see with your uh, unaided eye. Uh, even I'm in a Bortle 5 zone. I can easily see the Pleiades with my unaided eye. One of the easiest deep sky objects to find and to view. Uh, there are many other examples of, uh, of uh, uh, open star clusters out there that you can view. One, for example, the wild duck cluster and so on. The other type of star cluster is called a, a globular star cluster. And again, the, the name kind of says it all. It's basically a spherical or globular shape of of stars grouped very, very closely together, uh, sometimes hundreds of thousands of stars in a cluster bound tightly together by gravitational attraction and gravitational force and unable to escape from the cluster because of that. Uh, these can really be spectacular in the sky. Uh, one of the more common ones, one that I enjoy viewing uh, and that I've taken a couple of photographs of over the years is M13. Uh, which is uh, the great globular star cluster in the constellation Hercules. And there are a number of others of these as well uh, uh, to, to view. Uh, you can look at, uh, the, we did a video earlier, and you may not have seen that one yet. Uh, this is my way of getting you to go back and watch more, but no, just kidding. Uh, we presented a, a resource, which was a place you can go and look at information about every object in the Messier catalog. And uh, that you can learn uh, in that Messier catalog, you can find out just how many globular clusters, open clusters, how many nebulae, how many galaxies uh, are, uh, are there and available for you to view. And you can find out how many of those may be within the reach of amateur astronomers. But those are 
the major deep sky objects that uh, you're going to be concerned about as you progress through the hobby. Now, I must say a word here about these deep sky objects. And this is from my personal experience as well as from what I've read. Uh, the degree of light pollution that exists in the area where you do your viewing is going to limit the, the, the number of deep sky objects that you'll be able to view and uh, image, or at least it will limit uh, the quality of the viewing that you'll be able to do. They're so dim, most of them, so far away that they're difficult to view in light polluted skies. And so you all owe it to yourselves if you're in light polluted skies, try to occasionally, as opportunity allows, get out to a region of darker skies where you'll have a better opportunity, a better chance of seeing some of these beautiful, amazing, inspirational deep sky objects. But you'll just have to deal with a lot of frustration there. Uh, uh, these are difficult to see. They're faint. They're not called faint fuzzies for nothing. Now, there are some of them that uh, you can actually, uh, very few of them, that you can actually see with your unaided eye and can see well within, you know, light polluted skies, but those are few and far between, and for the most part, you will find this a little frustrating, and you'll need to get out to darker skies to really get a good view of them, or you'll have to learn how to do a little long exposure astrophotography in order to gather enough light or signal uh, to, to make these things visible uh, in the form of a photograph. And that's one reason why I got into astrophotography because I wanted to be able to, to see something in a photograph that I had taken that I couldn't see properly through my telescope or certainly with my unaided eye. So please just be prepared to deal with the frustration, uh, the challenge, as a better way to put it probably, in viewing many of the deep sky objects with an amateur telescope from light polluted skies. That is a problem. You need to, to, to sojourn out to darker skies from time to time to give you a real chance to really get good views of these amazing objects. Now we could go on. Uh, if you're diligent and uh, uh, don't mind a challenge, you can actually find and view some of the larger asteroids. Uh, you can find and view comets. Uh, there are some amateur astronomers who have been able to track and, and take some really good photographs of the International Space Station. So all of these objects and more are available to us out there. They're all amazing, they're all exciting, they're all inspirational, and they provide an endless opportunity for us to be educated about this great universe in which we live. And I just thought that I would take the time in this video to talk about those. And, uh, you know, if you didn't know before all of those things are available to you as a backyard astronomer, now you do. And all you need to do is just go out there and start getting involved. Hope this has been useful to you. Uh, that's the goal. Uh, and uh, so we're going to uh, wrap this video up right here, and we'll soon be back with another one on the Old Gazer channel. Until then, let me close as always by wishing you clear skies and good viewing.